although my although my biodata is in kannada version he took he, would, uh, he easily translated it into english in order to convey <laughs> the fact of my life uh, to all the participants who have the diversity in terms of their language so today's topic is actually the human rights uh, nanjun swami sir asked me to speak on this topic the human rights for all the teachers who belong to different branches of knowledge this particular subject is this particular topic is really relevant and rational its rationality and relevance cannot be challenged for the simple reason that all of us are human beings and all of us are entitled to the human rights by virtue of our uh, being human beings naturally we have these human rights and uh, each and every teacher interested with the responsibility interested with the responsibility to bring about a transformation in the society in general and in the life of uh, the each and every student whom we come across in day to day uh, business of our teaching inside the class we have to take into account the greatest value that uh, these human rights have in fact the strength and stability of the life of an individual largely depends upon not simply the pious wishes but the actual exercise of the rights that we have so naturally in my today's uh, class um, i do like to just focus on various dimensions of the human rights ranging from its a uh, concept because although the students and teachers and the scholars of political science might be aware of uh, the conceptual understanding of the human rights the non political science teachers are also aware of the human rights but still in the vocabulary of the political science quite naturally the right is defined in a specific and scientific way that's the reason why i try my level well, best to be very much very much rudimentary in uh, uh, dealing with the concept of human rights secondly i also touch upon some important uh, forms of the human rights and uh, for just in order to have a familiarity quite naturally we have to look at uh, some important uh, aspects of the human rights that has been developed in the post war period post war period means 1945 onwards where the liberal agenda of the human rights unfolded itself on account of the collective efforts of the global community so naturally the very united nations charter as an important uh, document especially the preamble has laid a strong foundation for the growth and relevance of the human rights and uh, more than 100 uh, conventions have already been uh, accepted by the united nations general assembly these uh, conventions pertain to various dimensions of the human rights various types of the human rights quite naturally united nations as a global governing 
arrangement uh, has been successful in uh, creating, in promoting, and even in expanding, and to some extent uh, in monitoring the enforcement of the human rights. So that is the reason why uh, we have to understand the human rights being the teachers from various dimensions. And uh, December is actually, especially the 10th December, 1948, is most important uh, uh, date that is an illustrious or historic date, a red letter day in the history of the human rights. So naturally on 4th December, I am asked to speak about it. Perhaps uh, had I got an opportunity to speak on human rights on 10th of December, I, I could have considered myself more lucky, but still uh, <clears throat> six days before, that is on this day itself, I'm very lucky to speak on this in order to, uh, what to call share some of my ideas. Um, let me uh, also request all the participants, if you have uh, any questions, instead of putting them in the chat box, kindly you may raise a question directly to me. Even if you raise your hands, I may not be able to see. And that is the reason why I request you to uh, 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 raise your question and uh, seek clarification from me. And you too can also share your ideas when, as ever and whenever you are tempted to do so. So conceptually speaking, uh, uh, in today's class, I do like to state that human rights are the, nothing but the interests. But what kind of interests these are? This question has to be answered by all of, all of us very sincerely. All interests cannot be considered as a, as a, as a right. So what kind of interests have to be taken into consideration then? The interests have to be transformed into claims, but there should be some important criteria on the basis of which these uh, interests or the claims that have to be transformed into rights. So naturally, we have got n number of interests, infinite number of interests in our life. I said, what it should have then? It should have a social recognition. Society should accept that uh, some of the interests may be regarded as important claims. So socially recognized claims can be considered as the rights. Mere social recognition is not enough because Society is, although the cradle of the state and several political and non-political institutions and associations, it is not going to, what you call, create the rights in the strict sense of the term. So that is the reason why, besides the social recognition, we wanted to have the local recognition sorry, legal recognition. Legal recognition is equally important. Why, why legal recognition? Because although the state is itself the creation of the state, it is interested with the responsibility. Wow. To... Hello? Please mute, Ravi sir, please mute. Some disturbance is there. Resolved, sir. You can start. Continue, sir. Okay. So state, as a political institution, so to say it is a supreme political institution, equipped with the sovereignty, and also equipped with the some other institutions like most important institutions like government, which itself functions in accordance with the established law of the state, has the capacity to create rights. And these rights in accordance with the 
legal theory of so many legal uh, 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 le uh, the scholars who have laid emphasis on the significance of the legal theory of the state so legal theory of the rights so naturally the legal theory clearly indicates that uh, legal recognition is indispensable and necessary for the rights so naturally legally recognized interests and claims are considered as the rights besides the social recognition and legal recognition and legal sanction it should also have what you call the political support so just i have uh, uh, missed one point here that besides the social recognition and political support political support is indispensable and necessary because the representatives in the modern days in the modern days of democracy and uh, the politic the political power which the state exercises naturally is behind the creation and the proliferation and expansion of these rights so naturally political support is indispensable and necessary that is the reason why quite often in parliamentary system in presidential form of the governments in republics uh, we do see that uh, our representatives exercise the political support and they place they represent the demands of the people and legislative institutions or representative institutions are acting are are actually acting as the uh, institutions which legitimize the interests of the people and demands of the people and they convert these interests and demands in the form of the legislations in order to legitimize the interests of the people and they will be considered as the rights so naturally such a process is there which will transform the the common interests of the people into the rights so this is the actual concept of the rights that means it's a socially recognized a legally recognized and politically supported and a legally enforceable uh, interest is called a right so the rights are many many in nature and uh, many have theorized it in different way but herod j lasky lasky uh, the author of the grammar of politics i think all political science uh, teachers and all those who have read political science right from pc first year and those who have the uh, passion for political science they they are aware of uh, this important uh, book written by herald j lasky he himself was uh, the teacher of uh, uh, our uh, farmer uh, president k r narayanan so naturally we do understand he said rights are nothing but those social conditions these are the essential just and humane conditions essential for the development of an individual in the society these are socially inevitable conditions just and humane social conditions we have to understand the word just just means not simply just in the common sense of the term but when we use the word just it means it is supported by the notion of justice so quite naturally it is also humane that means humanness is very much inherent in these rights so just and humane social conditions which are indispensable and necessary for the exercise of the freedom and other important uh, rights of the individual so naturally herald j lasky's uh, definition is very much interesting and it is it can be quoted and cited everywhere it, as a, as an important uh, um, parameter to define the human rights so naturally dear friends all of us are aware of the fact that uh, conceptually speaking these human rights have evolved uh, uh, ever since the dawn of human reflection men are aware of these rights but rights without uh, duties 
will not have much value that is the reason why political thinkers and also the common people they are tempted to think about the significance of the obligations of the right duties along with the rights so after understanding this human rights we should know its nature frankly speaking they are natural because human rights are natural because they were there even in the uh, even in the pre state period even even at the time of the uh, before the birth of an individual individual is entitled to rights that is the reason why it's called pre natal rights pre life rights and uh, during a uh, pregnancy when a mother uh, uh, before giving the birth of a child quite naturally she tries to take care of uh, the uh, the growing fetus <coughs> in the inside the womb so it clearly indicates that uh, uh, the the uh, movement against the abortion was there but of course nowadays even right to abortion is given to the women in order to avoid what to call the birth of the anomalous children so that is the reason why in order to prevent uh, what to call uh, gender uh, determination also where female infanticide was very much in vogue in uh, uh, till some uh, time till recently also uh, in order to avoid what to call female infanticide uh, and also feticide uh, the the very uh, gender indetermination in, in or gender determination was uh, um, nullified by the law it clearly indicates that that the human rights has got its own relevance and uh, its characteristics uh, clearly state that human rights are natural and they are also universal everywhere in these days we do see that rights are universal they are there in united states of america they are there in england they are there in india and of course depending upon the ideological priorities and reflections of the prior priorities and predilections of the state they have got their own relevance why because when uh, uh, soviet union and united states of america were vying with each other for uh, uh, for, for, for their own ideologies during those times also the human rights uh, as important uh, um, what you call um uh, uh, necessities of the mind mankind they they were also subjected to intense uh, debate between the uh, soviet union uh, which was on grounds of communism uh, contesting uh, some uh, set of rights and united states of america which was uh, in favor of the capitalism liberalism and capitalism was very much interested in upholding and respecting certain rights so likewise these were subjected to what you call the ideological uh, jostling that ideological jostling uh, was responsible sometimes for lesser importance of the human rights but after the end of the cold war you do see the human rights have almost uh, become the post cold war ideology so that is the reason why we are uh, practicing in day to day life and, and we are trying to give, we are trying to give more importance to these human rights in these days in post cold war period especially the intensification of the movement towards uh, the human rights throughout the world has led to the creation of so many institutions responsible for protecting and monitoring and also promoting the human rights likewise even in the context of uh, india also national human rights uh, commission was established in the year 1993 and uh, um, as per its uh, uh, wish uh, human rights uh, commissions are also established in uh, different states of india in order to uh, see that human rights are not violated 
and even if the human rights are violated uh, due uh, justice is given to the victims of those whose rights are violated by either by the state agency or by some other agencies so likewise uh, we are talking about the human rights in day to day life so there are n number of rights and these rights are very much uh, important for example right to life is there see civil rights are there political rights are there even universal declaration of the human rights which was adopted by the general assembly on 10th december 1948 it consists of around 30 important articles and these 30 articles are also significant and they uphold the relevance of the human rights throughout the world every individual has an inherent right to freedom we are free we have right to life we have right to liberty and we have right to property also right to life liberty and property this these rights were very much uh, championed by john locke he himself is a father of what you call liberalism and uh, liberal thinking was responsible for what you call the expansion of the rights beyond the boundaries of the human imagination so rights are there but there is always a debatable issue whether these natural rights are really natural quite often people have the tendency to contest the rights in different ways we have right to life but to what extent our life is safe under the under the circumstances of stress and strain created both by the state and non state actors so quite naturally we try to look at rights from different uh, perspectives here so civil rights are there political rights are there economic rights are there social rights are there cultural rights are there nowadays we are talking about the environmental rights so international uh, covenant on is on civil and political rights which uh, itself was considered as the first generation of rights according to carroll and subsequently we also entered into one more uh, important set of rights that is international covenant on social economic social and cultural rights and uh, from 1970 onwards from 1967 onwards especially 1970s and 80s we began to speak about uh, the uh, convention on uh, development rights united nations convention on uh, declaration of development rights also so development is most important for us and similarly uh, some groups rights are also there for example rights of the migrants rights for the refugees and uh, um, united nations convention on the uh, elimination of all forms of uh, discrimination against women and united nations convention on the elimination of uh, uh, discrim racial discrimination such and several conventions have been brought into og on account of the intervention of the united nations especially the third purpose mentioned in the uh, uh, one among the articles of the united nations i think uh, uh, the first article it clearly states that international uh, cooperation is indispensable is necessary in order to promote what you call uh, humanitarian uh, this thing is indispensable is necessary in all spheres of uh, human life so naturally taking the clue from that particular article good number of article uh, good number of uh, human rights have been uh, what you call created in the post war period after 1945 so international convention on the uh, child rights 1989 is also important in this regard and uh, in 2067 united nations convention on rights of persons with disabilities uh, was also adopted by the general assembly and uh, nearly 64 uh, countries have adopted have ratified this particular convention including india it clearly 164 not 64 164 countries have uh, adopted it 
it clearly indicates that uh, United Nations, under its uh, auspicious, uh, it has been successful in creating what you call the necessary infrastructure at the global level in order to give credence to the human rights. That is the reason why the citizens of this entire globe have the responsibility to respect, to uphold, and observe these human rights. These human rights are indispensably necessary to lead a happy and decent life. Happy and decent life are most important things that we have to bear in mind. Besides happiness and decency, we cannot afford to ignore the health. Health is equally important. So that is the reason why in all the regions of the world, whether it is a Europe, whether it is Africa, whether it is in Asia Pacific, um, whether it is in uh, um, uh, some other areas, we do see that European Convention on Human Rights are also there, then People's Charter, uh, African Charter on uh, People's Rights. So such and several regional and uh, uh, global conventions have been adopted in order to strengthen and consolidate the base for what you call the operation of the human rights at uh, different uh, levels. But uh, we should see that even in our constitution also, we have got some important rights. And in fact, the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights inspired the makers of the Indian constitution to incorporate and uh, incorporate these rights uh, even in our uh, 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 third part and the fourth part of the Indian constitution. Although uh, the makers of the Indo Indian constitution have borrowed uh, some important rights from some, some provisions from uh, different uh, constitutions, they, have al they were also inspired by the universal declaration of the human rights. It clearly indicates that uh, universal declaration of human rights and uh, in uh, as, a, as a foundation uh, was responsible to create uh, so many uh, uh, rights. So similarly, we do see that our constitution is not less important. It has created the right to equality and uh, freedom. Liberty is there for all of us, right to liberty of life is there. Uh, we have also freedom against uh, arbitrary detention, right against the exploitation of both women and children, right to religion is there, right to education and culture, right to constitutional remedies. All these fundamental rights are actually uh, defined and described as the uh, uh, political doctrines of the uh, political doctrines for political democracy. Similarly, we have also uh, the rights in the form of the directive principles of the state policy, which are intended to create a, a socio economic democracy in the country and which are intended to bring about a, a welfare state. So, Lenin went to the extent of stating that without socio economic rights, political rights will have no strength. Similarly, without uh, assuring a proper provision for the functioning of socio-economic democracy, political democracy will become just a for profane thing. Similarly, political rights will become just dry words without the exercise of, without the provision for the exercise of the socio-economic democracy or socio-economic rights. All these are the foundation for what we call the human rights. But being the teachers, we have a responsibility to create an awareness about these rights inside the class, irrespective of the category of the students. This aside, we should understand that it is also a source of several debates. For example, to what extent the state is capable of ensuring all these rights for the citizens? Is there no role for the civil society? Of course, in the age of the globalization, it is quite often said that rights of the marginalized the sections of the society everywhere in, in, in throughout the world, perhaps the space for the exercise of these rights 
is becoming narrow according to some people. Some people go to the extent of stating that those who are able to enjoy economically, economic power, they will be able to exercise their rights better than others. Those who have a better educational status, they are capable of enjoying their rights by virtue of their political awareness. Of course, there are n number of challenges to the enjoyment of these rights. And the exercise of the rights always depends upon the capacity of an individual. For example, Amartya Sen, he laid emphasis on the significance of the capability approach to the education. Of course, capability building is indispensable and necessary. Human rights and human resources are closely related. Human rights and social justice, they are closely related. And the state cannot abdicate its responsibility in a true sense of the term because you do see that more and more people are becoming conscious. Even in 1990, when Soviet Union was on the verge of uh, what you call disintegration, the people in United States, sorry, Soviet Union in 1987 and 88 itself, they began to question the exploitative tendency of the communist leaders who were trying to, what you call, enjoy all sorts of leisures and all sorts of uh, prosperities at the cost of the <laughs> labor community, which was actually creating the necessary resources for strengthening the state. They began to see that uh, the freedom that could be guaranteed in democracy would be better for them rather than being the birds of the cages under the Soviet Union. So one uh, scholar by name, um, uh, by name uh, uh, Anil Chaudhary, he wrote an article in mainstream. In that article, I, I saw that uh, communication, information and communication revolution brought about by what you call the information and communication technology was able to break the barriers of the states. In consequence, people throughout the world began to dream about drinking the nectar of freedom and democracy throughout the world. In consequence, people began to question the very principles of the socialism in practice. They began to question the communist regime's authoritarian tendency. This is the reason why in most of the Soviet Union uh, states, you do see they broke away from the Soviet Union and became independent states. So you do understand the power of the human rights. Man should not lead his life against the nature of the man himself. Human nature is always changing. Right from the days of Machiavelli, you do see that man is inclined to, do, inclined to what you call, uh, uh, do certain things which are in the interest of his development. So whether the man is selfish or selfless, all they are contingent upon the fulfillment of his desires. So conceptually, contextually, textually, and in pragmatic uh, dimension of the life, you do see that uh, human rights are most important uh, 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 what you call conditions which will determine our uh, uh, the comforts and the failure of an individual to understand the significance of these rights will definitely what you call create uh, um, unhealthy conditions in the life of an individual. So assertiveness on part of the individual largely depends upon his rationality. We should be rational enough. And these are the base for creating the public policies. Because uh, here Kiran Gajnur sir and others are here who are very much <coughs> familiar with the public policy and public administration, the development administration, the phenomenological approach, the human rights approach, e-governance and good governance. 
all these things are nothing but the paraphernalia created by the state in order to uphold the rights of the people and these rights of the people have to be reconciled with the authority of the state for the healthy development of both the individuals and the better security of the nation. So naturally, debatable questions like this, whether the state is supreme or the individual is supreme, whether the uh, liberty of the state is important or the liberty of the individual is important, whether the authority of the state is important or the liberty of an individual is most important. Whether do you want to give more importance to the sovereignty of the nation state or do you want to uphold the sovereignty of the people, that is popular sovereignty. So Ravish Mandel, uh, an author, he, he wrote a book on human rights and the national sovereignty, raises such important questions as these. So sovereignty is once upon a time was considered as a constraint upon the human rights. But no more. Sovereignty is no more a constraint upon the human rights because it too has also recognized the significance of the human rights by being an invisible soul of this state. You cannot imagine state without the existence of the people. So that is the reason why whatever be the ideology, ultimately it is the people who make the rights and who mar the rights. If they are really conscious enough in order to jealously guard their rights, they will succeed in it and they will be able to what you call ignite several movements when their rights are really threatened by various forces. So naturally, naturally, uh, in the age of uh, what you call neoliberalism, we do see that market forces are becoming stronger and stronger. Even the Marxist ideology or the neo-Marxist ideology that was responsible to jealously guard the rights of the uh, laborers, laboring class and other subaltern classes appears to have what you call suffered a setback. But yet the same ideology has the capacity what you call to become the potent voice of the uh, those people who are exploited by the market forces. But market forces also have created their own rights. So free market economy has created its own version of the rights. And during these days, we are thinking about the consumer rights. Customers are supreme. Consumer rights are most important. And we are talking about the consumer sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis national sovereignty. But uh, such kinds of uh, clashes and cliches need to be understood by us very carefully while addressing the issues pertaining to the human rights. So that's the reason why human rights, be they are right to life, right to health, right to education, right to travel, right to what to call um, uh, uh, many, many rights of this kind are there. For example, political rights, right to vote, right to contest election, then uh, right to criticize the public policy, which itself is quite often under the tremendous strain on account of the authoritarian voices of the, the people who are at the helm of the affairs. Um, and at the same time, you do see that uh, while criticizing the public policy, or while criticizing the government, we may be treated as anti-nationals. And in the name of what you call, we have also right to employment. But when the state is becoming uh, more and more um, a, a developmental state or a neoliberal state, which does not permit uh, too much uh, intervention of the state, that is, we, we are talking about in these days, or uh, even in the days of the John Stuart Mill, we spoke about uh, the minimum government and maximal governance. We are speak, we are invoking the same mantra even to this date, where minimum government and maximal governance. Whether this particular slogan is it really a ploy, or is it a fig leaf 
to hide some agenda whereby you are construct you are constricting the space available to the state and gradually you are trying to minimize the size of the government restructuring or delicensing deregulating uh, then uh, 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 gradual such deeds are there we want to delicense in the age of what you call uh, neoliberalism we want to minimize the role of the state if you minimize the role of the state you have to minimize the role of the you have to minimize the size of the government if the size of the government is minimized then automatically public sector will also be what you call uh, its uh, size is also minimized its scope is also reduced and quite often the employment opportunities available in the public sector will also become less and less so you give more space for the corporate sector here comes the question of reconciling reconciling what you call the issues of democratic deficiencies and economic efficiencies so right human rights and growth will also have a clash in the age of globalization so perhaps i am trying to put in too much into the minds of our uh, participants because i want to show how right from the days of what you call hammurabi when hammurabi he, he he had a code of conduct that code of conduct was actually anti human a babylonian king by name hammurabi in 7th 18th century bc understand 17th century bc long long ago so he introduced he introduced a code i for i and tooth for tooth that kind of institutionalized punishment was nothing but institutionalizing the what you call curtailment of the human rights of the people right from those days till this till these days you do see over a period of uh, several centuries human rights have grown in proportion uh, in in uh, uh, leaps and bounds so all of us are talking about the human rights we are discussing about whether should we continue to support death penalty whether should we continue to support physical punishment united nations convention against the torture united nations convention against the the inhuman and degraded treatment is also there it clearly states that the torture must be avoided a man may be uh, a criminal for reasons of uh, socio economic uh, situations for reasons of environment but that cruelty of an individual can be minimized by virtue of what to call giving a constant education a chance may be given for a, every individual to correct himself so likewise even lithuania that means uh uh, uh when ever an individual is in a difficult situation he wants to end his own life in order to end his suffering what we call in canada karuna marana so such and several issues are there and even in a uh, post globalized period also you do see that uh, most of the western countries are making use of uh, these human rights as an instrument as political instruments in order to uh, realize their own national interest so ranging from local to global level the human rights situation definitely differs nations they themselves create the situations for people to go on, go on wars you must be aware of the fact that there is a great scholar by name in his class he went to the extent of defining that war is nothing but the extension of the politics war is nothing but 
a legitimate extension war is nothing but a legitimate instrument of the nation it is an extension of the politics so likewise uh, uh, the great dictators like uh, mussolini they went to the extent of stating that war bears the stamp of the nobility of the nation nation states it clearly indicates the authoritarians how the justification to legitimize the war and inflict a heavy damage upon the human rights they killed so many people mussolini hitler and even in 21st century you must have the example of saddam hussein and some other uh, uh, people they violated the human rights rather in a, after a gruesome fashion so you do see that uh, in order to prevent uh, such kind of uh, uh, attacks on human rights nations have signed several conventions and uh, nations have enacted several laws within their nation in order to protect uh, the rights of the civilians nowadays world is becoming very much transparent world is becoming very much transparent so we are in the age of global democracy where uh, uh, nations have become more and more democratic and people are under uh, democratic regimes and they are creating their own governance and they are fighting for their rights they are becoming aware and there is a surging consciousness about uh, the rights and similarly they are also caring for their duty yet we do see that there are more number of reasons and more number of causes which are uh, very much violative of the human rights so naturally we the teachers how to expand our own canvas of the human rights beyond the imagination and we should uh, try to uphold the rights of the students inside the class and teach the human rights in the society and uh, there are a good number of laws and uh, these laws uh, the education about these laws is indispensable and necessary and in these days especially the students of political science and teachers of political science should be aware of one important fact that teaching constitution is losing its relevance i want to create an awareness i want to bring about this debate constitution should be read referred and adopted by each and every citizen of this nation but unfortunately in educational policies in our uh, educational programs in our curriculum uh, teaching constitution is becoming uh, given less importance and less priority we the political science teachers have to raise our voice against it because besides environment constitution should also be studied in depth by each and every citizen because constitution is the the secular religious scripture of the nation it is a, it is the secular scripture of the nation that the secular scripture has to be upheld by all of us we the students of political science students of law students of commerce students of sociology students of library and teachers have the responsibility to popularize and permit the principles and spirits of the constitution which strengthen our human rights so naturally we have to work in unison with each other in order to promote the human rights and uh, violations are taking place in the country and outside and during covid itself sad to the failure of sad to the carelessness of the state citizens and the callousness of the state rights of the people were violated ruefully migrants suffered a lot women suffered a lot children suffered a lot nearly 1200 doctors lost their lives nearly 40 lakh uh, uh, nearly uh, uh, 
nearly seven to eight lakh people or many, many, many lakh people have breathed their last and judiciary was itself sometimes callous and again when alerted by the advocates, it, it realized its uh, falsity and later on decided to uh, become what you call responsive to the beats and pulses of the people who were talking much about uh, the callousness of the state towards the people in the front of the human rights during COVID times. You do see sometimes uh, situations of this kind will definitely paralyze not only the policies, but also the administration. In Chamrajnagar itself, nearly 37 people breathed their last on account of the lack of uh, oxygen, uh, lack of or inability to supply oxygen in time to the people. I too received calls from my students and other people to help them for what you call uh, uh, getting uh, uh, admitted in hospitals for beds and other things. So naturally, we the teachers also played an active role during COVID in order to help not only our kit and kin and relatives, but also our students. Likewise, we do see the very canvas of the human rights is very vast. It's very dynamic. It's universal. It is humane. And it is linked with one another. They are linked with one another. So right to expression, we should allow our students to raise questions inside the class. And the, the teacher who faces these students should not become a dictator inside the class. And we have the responsibility to allow our students to raise questions. The more the questions are raised, more we will become inquisitive. There will be a tremendous improvement, not only within the faculties of our mind, but also the faculties outside. The cognitivity will be improved. We will be able to understand how students are able to think. They have the right to fair evaluation. How many of us are able to evaluate? How many of us are really able to judge the true potentiality of the students? So naturally, that justice, the fairness, that equity, that equality, that uh, uh, sense of liberty, then um, ability to, uh, the desire to allow them to assemble together and have a discussion. Discussion is an essential means for the exchange of our ideas and it will lighten the heart of an individual and brighten the brain. So likewise, the potentiality of the whole civilization and also the culture can be tapped to the best extent possible in order to promote the human rights. So civil society, we as a part of the civil society also have a responsibility to contest the state when state seeks to marginalize the rights of the people. And we have to promote the awareness among the people who wanted to enjoy, not only to enjoy the rights, and there are people who want to violate the rights. For them, we have to reform. Our prisons are full these days because they are, they are, they are full because of the criminality in the society. So criminals also have the right. They are also human beings. That is the reason why they should, their rights should also be upheld. They, they, they can also be reformed. So this kind of humanistic approach is there in the human rights. That is the reason why Immanuel Kant, he went to the extent of saying that the state can, be, can realize its best when it reaches its higher standard of morality. And the same is inculcated in the minds of the individuals. So that is the reason why a refined and uh, a ripened mind and wisdom are most important. And we, the teachers, have a responsibility to create that refined mind and ripened wisdom and sufficient luminous of light 
in the minds of the people because mind is the true source it is the origin of the evil and also it is the origin of the virtues so virtues and vices are internalized in the human beings themselves that's the reason why if we want to create a better civilization and a better culture we have to have better civilizational and cultural values within us not only in theory but also in practice so dear friends i think human rights have their uh, uh, what you call strengths but in order to make them more and more strong we should always practice them rather than preaching so um systemic uh, failures must be minimized uh, individual failures must be minimized and subsequently not only laws and institutions are enough as uh, uh, martin luther king said long back that mere laws are not sufficient it is the heart that has to be laws cannot control the heart of an individual laws sir not audible sir sir is disconnect i think uh, yes man sir hmm. sir is disconnect disconnect समती सर क्लोज आयता